What is happening guys? Cowboy here and welcome to the ultimate beginner's guide for Lords of the Fallen. Now this video is going to cover everything that I wish I had known going into this game. Uh, in depth we're going to be going into stats and soft caps, explaining status effects, combat techniques, the umbral lamp, showing you the blacksmith location, talking about weapons and runes, upgrading our lamp, maps, tanks, and pretty much everything you could want to know. Uh, so this video is going to be very minimal on spoilers, going to be trying to keep things spoiler free so you can enjoy the experience yourself, but you may see the names of some locations when we go to the fast travel menu. With all that being said, let's jump in, and the first thing I want to talk about is going to be stats and soft caps. Now unfortunately we don't have a back button in this game that will pull up access to explain what everything is, so instead that's what we are going to be doing. Now to start, I want to talk about vitality and endurance. These are very straightforward. This is going to dictate our health as well as our stamina. Now there is a very slight soft cap at 20 and a harder soft cap at 40. And then the essential hard cap is going to be up at 60. Uh, to break this down, going up to 20 vitality, you're going to have, I believe it's roughly 500 health. Getting up to 40 vitality, you get up to around 800 health. And then going up to 60, you would be at 1,000 health. After that, it's going to drop off significantly with you only getting, I think it's 5, maybe 3 health per point, all the way up to 99. Uh, stamina also functions in a similar fashion, but I will say I don't think you're going to really need to take your endurance past roughly 20 to 25. Now, in addition to affecting health and stamina, as you level up your character, as you level up stats in general, you're going to see your encumbrance go up. This is going to be the weight, the total amount of weight that you can equip. Uh, so this is going to include your rings, your amulet, your weapons, your armor, your ranged weapons. Uh, but you will see greater gains to encumbrance as you continue to level up your vitality. So you'll get more out of vitality than you would out of other stats. Uh, in addition to that, you'll also see the total amount of ranged ammunition that you have available go up as you level up your vitality as well as your endurance. Now as for the damage stats, these are all very straightforward. We have Strength, Agility, Radiance, and Inferno, and these are essentially just four different damage stats that are going to impact uh, either your physical damage, your holy damage, or your fire damage. Radiance type spells are tied to holy, inferno type spells are tied to fire, strength and agility are both considered physical, and lastly we have wither which is a bit unique but we'll talk about that a little bit later. All four of the damage caps are going to have their first soft cap at 50 and their second soft cap all the way up to 75. And what this means is if you are primarily a strength player, at minimum you should try to get up to 50 strength. That's where you're going to see the majority of your stat returns. If you want to go past that, going up to 75 is still going to be useful. Going past 75, however, you're going to see very minimal returns on further investments into strength. On top of that, to talk about the resistances. So we have Smite Bleed, Burn Ignite, and Frostbite Poison. Now we can break these down into three separate categories. Smite and Bleed are considered Radiant, Burn and Ignite are considered Rogar, and then Frostbite and Poison are in the Umbral or the Dark Tree. Now, three of them are very similar. Smite, Bleed, and Ignite all function almost identically. The idea is this is a status effect that's going to be built up on an enemy by delivering that status over and over again. It grows over several hits, and when it's filled, you're going to see a burst of damage, and then additional damage of a certain type is going to cause bonus hits. So to better break this down, if I'm hitting an enemy with something that has smite over and over again, eventually they're going to take a burst of holy damage. After that, any hit that deals holy damage is going to deal bonus damage until smite falls off the character. In a similar fashion, bleed also works like that, but by physical damage. So after you proc bleed, any attack that deals physical will deal bonus damage. And with ignite, after you proc ignite, any attack that deals fire will deal bonus damage. Uh, burn and poison are just damage over time. So burn is going to ignite the enemy. They're going to be, uh, well, I shouldn't say ignite since that's a status effect. It's going to light the enemy on fire and cause a slow damage over time effect that burns them. Poison is going to poison the enemy. It's going to fill on up and put them into a poison state where they're going to receive damage over time. Frostbite is a bit unique in that it's going to grow over several hits, similar to Smite, Bleed, and Ignite. And when it procs, we're going to see a burst of damage. And then if it's a player character, the stamina bar is going to be halved. Whereas if it's an enemy, they're going to take a burst of damage to their posture gauge. Now, looking at these in particular, if we look just below the uh, Agility and Inferno things, you can see these stats. The first one in the top left is going to be Bleed. 
the bottom left is going to be smite the middle top is going to be burn the middle bottom is going to be ignite the top right is going to be poison and the bottom right is going to be frostbite now in general status effects are going to be better if you are using dual weapons so you can apply them uh, twice as fast but we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, as we get into combat techniques but just keep in mind that status effects in this game are very very strong uh, there's often unique combos you can use this weapon in particular deals burn damage and i have a ring here where while i inflict burn buildup i'm simultaneously going to inflict ignite buildup and since this does physical and fire damage i can effectively get burn up on the enemy proc the ignite on the enemy and then i'm dealing bonus damage with my fire damage on top of them being ignite ignited ignited i don't know and burnt at the same time so there's lots of synergies that you can look for in this game to further utilize those elements uh talking more briefly about the the, the stats real fast as i mentioned with the, the damage stats they go up to 50 and 75 it's very straightforward it's going to say on your weapon this weapon is strength uh this weapon is going to be strength and agility this weapon is going to be strength this weapon is going to be strength this weapon is going to be inferno uh, going over to this guy this is going to be radiance and agility so you really just want to level up the damage stat that's going to correspond to whatever you are using pretty straightforward right uh, besides that like i mentioned encumbrance is going to go up as you level things up and there are things such as the ring of bones which will increase your maximum equipment load now to talk about encumbrance briefly this is going to dictate the iframes on your roll as well as how fast you can roll if we are at heavy encumbrance you can see I have a kind of a slow roll here, a little bit of a dolphin dive. If I go down to medium encumbrance, much zippier, and you can see I'm able to roll even quicker than before. And if I take that down even lower and go into the light category, you can see I am now just going all over the place. So keep in mind that depending on how much gear you wear, that's going to dictate uh, how fast you're able to roll in general i wouldn't suggest going past medium uh, i played for a little bit with heavy just to see if it was viable at all in this game and in true souls fashion heavy is, is you're not going to have a good time uh, moving on from the elements and stats let's talk about the combat techniques now combat in this game is pretty straightforward we have our r1 basic attacks we have our r2 which are our heavy attacks now heavy attacks are going to be the same speed as basic attacks but we can charge them there is no charging a light attack whereas there is charging heavy attacks and we can charge them all the way up you'll notice there was a, a sound cue there now you can charge it past that and you'll do even more damage so you could let it go early and there it fully qualifies as a charge attack but you can overcharge it to get even more damage out of it on top of this, we can hit Y at any time in combat and go to a two-handed stance. And this is going to allow us to vary up our moveset. But what's really nice about this is we can swap between this mid-combat. So, for example, I could go light into heavy, into one-handed heavy, into one-handed charge heavy. Or I could open up one-handed and, you know, get some AoE out. And then after I've cleared the trash, switch into a two-handed charged heavy attack. Uh, in addition to that, we have two other attacks we're able to work in by hitting our bumpers. We have a kick, which this can be used to posture break an enemy. And we also have an AoE attack by hitting the right bumper, or excuse me, the left bumper and the right trigger. And that's usually going to perform an AoE of some type, which is great for if you're surrounded by enemies and you are trying to clear them on out. Uh, besides those, we also have a lot of standard type stuff. We have running attacks, so that's a running heavy whereas this is a running light. They also function with back steps as well, so back step heavy, back step light. We have rolling attacks that we can also do, so pretty much everything you would expect uh, from the Souls combat is going to be alive and well in this game. Now, whether we have a shield or a weapon on, we can block and parry at any given time. Blocking and parrying functions very, very similar to Sekiro in this game. The idea being that a well-timed block will count as a parry, and just blocking instead will count as a block. So to better showcase this, we're going to warp to a area that's a little bit later in the game, just to, to really demonstrate uh, using parry as well as getting kicks off. There's a nice big enemy here that I can fight that is excellent for demonstrative purposes. So 
So if I were to just hold block, you'll notice my health is disappearing and becoming white. This is what's known as withered health. Withered health, you can regain back from attacking at any given time. We are taking stamina damage, but that is one of the core mechanics of this game. The idea being that if you're playing defensive and blocking attacks, instead of getting hurt directly, that health is withering. And then you're able to get that back by hitting the enemy by utilizing your aggression. Now you'll also notice the enemy has a circle in the middle of them, like my target reticle, but there is a smaller circle around it, and that is the enemy stagger gauge. Now there are a couple different ways we can impact this. We can hit the enemy with a charge attack, that's going to reduce it. We can also get a parry on the enemy, which is a perfectly timed block. The perfect blocks, or the, uh, the regular blocks didn't do all that much, but you'll notice that the perfect blocks are taking large chunks out of that, that, uh, that little ring that's around the enemy. And then once I get them low, I'll hit them with a kick to finish them off, and then open them up to a grievous strike. Now you don't have to kick them to finish them off, but the kicks are a very fast way to get an enemy and finish off that bar. So if there's just a little bit left on that posture gauge, a kick is an excellent way to put them into that stun state. Uh, just to show some, some lesser guys here, I'm going to take out the archer so I don't deal with him. You can see how much I did to a basic enemy like this. We've already opened him on up. Uh, against bosses, you're going to find the charged heavies are a really, really good way to help hurt that stagger gauge. Uh, but I really, really like the addition of, of essentially a perfect block. Because you can do it, you can do this with, with uh, two-handing your weapon. You can do this with uh, dual-wielding your weapon. You know, you can still block. Uh, obviously, stuff that's lighter, such as a light shield, is going to have larger parry windows than a medium shield or a heavy shield. But the point being that you can block and you can get that, that perfect block or that parry with any weapon in the game, whether you're using a physical weapon, a shield, or whatever the case may be. Uh, I didn't talk about it earlier, but real fast, we also have two different dual wield movesets in this game. We have a heavy dual wield moveset and a light dual wield moveset. The heavy moveset is going to be very AoE focused, lots of large sweeps here, and then the heavy attacks in it are going to be lots of big, big overhead slams. In general, this is almost exclusionary because of the sheer weight of doing two heavy things, uh, but equipping two light weapons, we have a much faster dual wield moveset where we are able to be very aggressive. Similarly, using the heavy attacks with it. And one of the great advantages of dual wield in this game is actually going to be around using status items because using things that are going to utilize bleed or smite or whatever the case is, we're getting double the status build up here. So while we can do this with heavy weapons, because of how slow they are, it's not going to be as useful. And this is one of the main reasons that if you're using agility or you're using even lighter strength weapons, the dual wielding is definitely something for consideration so that you can build up status faster on your targets. Moving on from combat techniques, let's talk about the Umbral Lamp. Wait, actually, no, let's not. Let's talk about ranged weapons. I almost missed ranged weapons. Uh, now, in this game, our last stat over here, right here, was either an alternate weapon or a shield. This is going to be our throwing hand initially. We could also put a crossbow on, or we could put a catalyst on. This is going to dictate your ranged option for the game. With the base, the throwing hand, you can have up to three different throwing weapons. They're going to have different ammunition costs. As I hold the left trigger and I hit the various buttons to scroll through them, up in the top left you can see uh, a little yellow mark, and that means I'm going to use one ammo, I'm going to use three ammo, I'm going to use two ammo, and that's going to dictate how expensive something is. If you put a crossbow on in this stat, you then choose from different bolts, or if you were to put a, a bow on, I don't think I have a bow, uh, you would have different arrows to choose from. If you were to put a catalyst on, you're going to have different spells to choose from, and it's also going to replace your ammunition gauge with a mana gauge, and that's going to dictate how much you can cast. To get back mana, you're either going to be using mana stone clusters, or there are runes that will allow you to regain mana over time or get mana in combat, and we'll talk about those a little bit later in the blacksmithing portion of the video. 
All right, now that we've talked about that, let's actually go and talk about the Umbral Lamp. So while you hit up on the D-pad to go into your ranged options, hitting down will pull out the Umbral Lamp. Now there are a couple different functions to the Umbral Lamp. One is going to be Vestige Seeds. Anytime you see a small area of flowers, you also notice the lamp is blinking in the bottom right there. I can plant a Vestige Seed down, and that is going to create a temporary checkpoint for me, similar to a Vestige or a Bonfire. What I mean by temporary is that you can only have one of these out at a time. So while vestiges in the world are permanent, at least in new game, once you use a vestige seed, any previously placed vestige seed will be gone. So these are good for if you're venturing into a zone, you haven't found a vestige yet, and you're like, you know, I need a point that's going to be safe. You can plant one, and as long as you don't plant a new one, it will persist. We can also find stigmas, or I believe it's stigmatas actually, out in the world by using our umbral lamp. And these are memories of a battle that had already occurred. You can watch these and receive some awards. Uh, in addition to that, we can hit the right bumper, and this will vacuum up any souls in the area and kill certain uh, little souls that defend enemies. Or we can hit right trigger to do a soul flay technique, which we'll talk about that in just a second. To fully enter Umbral, you would hold down X, and now we are in the Umbral world. So now I could Soul Flay this, and it's going to pull this on out, and it's going to show me a battle of the Light Reaper battling the Cursed Knight. But while we're in Umbral, there are a couple new things that happen. The first being that you'll notice my health, now half of it is considered Withered. On top of that, there may be alternate paths that you can find in Umbral that didn't exist when you were in the regular world. So make sure you're regularly looking around with your lamp, and if you see something, it may be worth entering the Umbral world to explore it. Now, while you are in Umbral, there is a gauge up in the top right. That's that eye that's blinking. The longer you're in Umbral, the higher the modifier will increase. So right now it's at 1.1, meaning I'm gaining 10% extra vigor from killing enemies. It'll get up to 1.2, 1.3, 2.0. Eventually it gets all the way up to 3.0. The eye will turn red. You will be unable to heal. And the, uh, I believe his name is the Scarlet Reaper, will show up. And this is a difficult enemy that you should try to avoid until you're a much higher level. And one of the nice things about being in Umbral is I can see things that I wouldn't see otherwise. For example, this little guy that's attached to this enemy that is otherwise protecting him. If I were to hit him, you'll notice I'm not getting a whole lot of damage because he is empowered by that Umbral Parasite. If I were to use my lamp, I've popped the Parasite. He has lost his aura, and now I can beat him on death. Another nice thing about the lamp is, I learned this way too late, but you don't actually need to run over and pick up souls. You can just point the lamp at them, and your lamp will vacuum them all into you. So definitely make sure to utilize that lamp. Uh, in addition, as you are in the Umbral Realm, enemies will gradually spawn. It'll start with little basic enemies like the ones you just saw. The, um, I guess we can just call these things... Uh, I don't know, the, the, the Fallen or whatever their name. They don't have a, a distinct name. Uh, but besides them, there are more dangerous enemies that will spawn the longer you stay in the Umbral Realm. So definitely be aware of this. Now, while you can enter the Umbral Realm at will, to leave the Umbral Realm, you either need to find a Vestige or you need to find one of these totems. And by interacting with it, this will immediately take you out of the Umbral Realm. Any Umbral enemies that were around will disappear. And we're now back to just fighting the base enemies that are an Axiom. But you do want to be cautious when you're using your Umbral Lamp to look around. If you're hit while you're peering into the Umbral world, uh, if an Umbral enemy in particular attacks me, that will immediately yank me into the Umbral world. Now, right now, it's, it's, it's not happening because these guys aren't Umbral. Uh, let me see if I can... Uh, I think if I can find an area where there is one. There, there are areas in the world where there are already umbral enemies, so you, you may look and you'll see an enemy try to attack you, drop your lantern. If he hits you, you're going to get yanked into the world. And what's tricky is, keep in mind, while we can freely enter umbral at will, we can't leave at will. We need to find either a vestige or one of those totems to leave umbral, and so being pulled in all of a sudden can definitely be quite stressful to your experience. Uh, besides that, let's talk about the Soul Flay mechanic. So one of the nice things you can do with Soul Flay is essentially redirect enemies. You pull the soul out of them, and then they will go to their soul after. So if I move my left stick, you can see how his body is flying towards that soul. And you're going to gain more charges of these as you level up your lamp. 
but you can also damage the soul after you've ripped it out. So right now, I'm basically hurting his soul. And you can see I hurt his soul enough to fully wither him, and at that point, I can attack that enemy, and all that wither health is going to disappear. So definitely use your soul flay. Anytime you encounter a bigger enemy, uh, soul flay is going to be one of your best friends. In fact, there's there's quite a few encounters in this game where, you know, uh, there's a difficult enemy, grab them, yeet. And if there just happens to be a cliff ledge there, that enemy is going to get uh, tossed over that ledge. So you can really abuse the soul flay mechanic to your advantage if you uh, are just intuitive in how you decide to use it. I'm going to put on my, my actual weapon for this next part. Uh, so before we go back to the hub, the, the next thing I'd like to talk about is going to be uh, upgrading weapons and upgrading our lamp and all that. But before that, I want to actually cover the exact location of the blacksmith because I know a lot of people are going to want to know where this NPC is. It is a little bit tricky. You can definitely miss it. And so I want to show exactly how to get to the blacksmith. So right here, we are from the bell vestige. You're going to find this as you play. It's pretty easy. And I'm just going to speed run right through this to get over to where our friend is at. So from this area, when you enter the Umbral Realm, we would drop down. We'd go up the stairs, run around. Now, there's a bunch of enemies here. I'm not going to be spending time fighting them. I will hit that one just to get back the withered health that I lost. These are pustules on the wall. Uh, we can also use our our vacuum function to pop these, which is pretty cool. This is to get in some damage. But as we continue to follow this path around, eventually it's going to go up. And then after it goes up, it's going to lead us outside. And once we've made it outside, we have a totem right here that we can interact with after we have killed these enemies which will then take us out of the Umbral. Now, if you didn't go Umbral and you took the alternative path, uh, you would you would end up right below this area. But what we're going to do here is we're going to drop down and we're going to kick this ladder down, uh, and that'll be, be really useful. That way we can go back up there later. But what we actually want is that ladder that's right in front of us. Now, you could just run straight over here if you wanted, but I do think it's worth taking that humble path just to get this ladder for later. Uh, but, so, right back there, this is where we would have popped out if we didn't go umbral. Instead, we came out up above. Here's a perfect example of soul flay. Dangerous enemy is now gone. So we want to take this ladder on down. You may want to plant a seed, because we're going to have to go into Umbral. You don't have to, but if you're worried about dying, definitely plant a seed. Going to drop down here. We're just going to run through. We're not going to worry about all the enemies. We're just going to kill the, the ranged ones, get them out of the way. Run back up. Around the corner and take up another ladder. Drop down here. A couple enemies that are going to try and ambush you, so I would suggest just roll past. You can see even more enemies here. Uh, in this part, there's going to be a bit of a challenging fight. You can already see that this enemy is protected by Umbral Parasite, so we want to get rid of that. And then there's also going to be uh, two additional enemies here. The um, I'm going to have to kill you, aren't I? You're going to be a pain if I don't. drop down and climb up, get rid of that thing real fast. This is why I wanted to just speed run it. I knew you were going to be annoying to me. I mean, typically you wouldn't speed run this, though. You would actually be, like, fighting your way through. So, after you have killed that enemy, you'll notice we have, uh, 
a couple of these different spiky head guys. You can actually go over here and basically just kind of cause them to path on over, potentially run off, or you can use Soul Flay to get rid of them. I like using that to get rid of them. Um, and now, right through here is where we want to go. Now this door is initially going to be blocked up. You're going to see a bunch of roots coming off of the door, and you're going to have to run around here and pop all those roots. After you do, though, you'll gain access to that door. We can pop that open. We can go down this way. And pick up some stuff that I left behind earlier. We can go down here, and we are now at the blacksmith. Now, the blacksmith is right in that cage that you see right below. But before you rescue the blacksmith, I would suggest you run on over into the elevator here. And this will take us right back up to that exact vestige where we started from. So that way you have a really nice shortcut. You can take the elevator back down. Uh, there's going to be some enemies in that pit below. You kill them, you get a key, you rescue the blacksmith, and then the blacksmith is going to go back to the hub, which is where we are going to jump next. And when it comes to upgrading weapons in Lords of the Fallen, it's pretty straightforward. Very similar to what you would expect from most Souls games. Talking to Gerlinda here. Uh, as we progress the game, she will sell the base upgrades, the, the small, regular, and the large shards. And then you are able to upgrade a weapon. So with this one, it's going to cost two, and then it's going to cost four, and then it's going to cost six. So our base ones are one through three. Our mediums are our four through six, and then our large are gonna be our seven through nine. Lastly, you're gonna need a chunk to get the weapon up to plus 10, and those are quite rare. So definitely make sure you decide what you really wanna take all the way before leveling a weapon. Additionally, as you progress through the game, you're gonna gain access to the ability to socket runes. These can either bolster your weapon or change their effect in some capacity. For example, I can increase the strength scaling of my weapon. I can increase the physical damage, but reduce the scaling, increase the posture damage, increase the damage of ranged and throwable attacks. Uh, weapons and shields can gain access to these runes via upgrading, and the amount of runes you have available is going to be tied into the level of the weapon itself. Um, it, the type of rune slot is also going to be tied to the weapon. So while this one has a round, a star, and a round, this is another grand sword, and this one has a diamond, a round, and a diamond. So keep that in mind. Depending on the type of weapon you get, that's going to dictate what you can get. But, you know, if I wanted to, to be a, a paladin, here we go. I can put that on, and then, well, if I farmed up a second one, I would get double mana on killing enemies. And then over here, I could do... Uh, you know, extra ranged or throwable weapons, which wouldn't really make sense. But anyway, point is, runes are a very, very useful system. And as I mentioned, as you progress the game, you'll always be able to purchase the tier one through tier nine mats from the vendor. They'll also sell you an infinite supply of Brio stones and mana stone clusters. Uh, these prices are also inflated. Stuff is usually cheaper, but some events happen and the blacksmith charges me more money. We'll just say that. Uh, besides that, let's also talk about upgrading our lamp. Now, there are three upgrades for the lamp that you can find in the game. And while the blacksmith happens over there, all the umbral stuff happens with our homie over here. Now, you need to be in the umbral world to talk to him. But as you find stuff to upgrade your umbral lamp, you're going to need to give him these chisels. There are three that you can gather. And then by doing that, you can socket different eyes in that are going to give you a primary effect and a secondary effect to your umbral lamp, making it more effective. And there's some really cool stuff you could do here. You know, uh, your, your presence in umbral is, is noticed and feared, used ranged weapons without ammunition, but at the cost of withered health, light attacks deal bonus damage, but only deal wither, regain health upon killing an enemy with a grievous strike, all sorts of really, really cool bonuses. So definitely hunt down those chisels and keep an eye out for those eyes. Uh, additionally, while we're at this guy, this is going to be where you get boss stuff. I don't want to show that since it's going to, you know, big spoilers there. Uh, but there's an item you can find in the Pilgrim's Perch that you give to him. And then after doing that, you can offer a remembrance and you can trade in your shrimp to gain access to uh, boss weapons, boss spells, boss armor. And when I'm talking about shrimp, I am talking about these little guys. Typically, you're going to get these... Uh, through viewing stigmatas that you see throughout the world. 
on top of that I don't know if they added it in yet I know they are planning on adding a way to just purchase the shrimp with eyes after talking to the devs because I expressed some, uh, some concerns about like you know getting all the boss stuff would require roughly 900 shrimp and you get like 300 I think per playthrough so they, they are going to add a way for us to farm the shrimp infinitely uh, which will be quite nice we're going to rest and hop on out uh, the last things I want to talk about are more minor, but I want to talk about the map and some tanks. Now, hopping on over to the journal, you'll see a list of any maps that you've picked up. And while these aren't maps in the true sense, they are maps in the sense that they'll give you a, a vague idea of where to go. So, for example, in here, it goes, says, you know, from the tree, go to the windmill, and then go to the large structure. Don't go to the bell door. The bell door has an X. Looking at Pilgrim's Perch, we want to go in here. Hey, those platforms, those platforms are important. Look for those. Once you're down here, we want to make our way up top, and that's going to lead us to, like, a door. You know, hey, we don't want to go through that doorway. That's going to be bad. Instead, there's, like, a platform right here. We want to go down, and it looks like we can go down, and there's going to be a little cove by a bell. We want to lurk for that. So if you're ever lost, these maps will give you a decent idea where to go, even if not a ton. And then lastly, the tanked. Now, the tanked system is basically the fashion souls. I absolutely love this. The tanks will allow you to freely change up the colors on your armor. So you can see I can just change up the color of my head, make it whatever I want, change up the gloves, change up, you know, change up everything. And that's super, super cool to me. I love being able to, to pick and choose the color scheme of our armor. And that's kind of how I got my, my Pentinent One look going on here. Uh, so really, really love the fashion souls going on in this game. Uh, but there's definitely a lot of systems going on here. I know I've had a lot of people asking me my thoughts of it, and I have a review on the channel. But honestly, this is probably one of my favorite uh, non from soft likes that not from soft likes non from souls likes that we have seen uh, just because of the sheer amount of systems going on in this game. I, I love the umbral system. I love the 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 amount of of. Uh, armor customization that we can do and, and like the fashion souls and whatnot the fluidity of the combat with changing between uh, two-handed attacks and one-handed attacks and charge attacks and aoe attacks but there's definitely a lot to go into and it, it can definitely be overburdening uh, to a new player so hopefully this video helps you out whether you are new or a souls veteran alike i know it's been a long one but regardless thanks for watching and if you need more help well come back by for the walkthrough